Good morning. Well, today is day 40 of school closures for our district. Yup, that's a thing. So according to my account, after today, we have seven work days remaining for students. So if you are on top of things and you are getting your work done and turned in and submitted to your teachers, after May 22nd, you will not have any new work to be graded. So that is excellent news for all of you. As for work for me, of course, you will still have access to Moe Max and all of the things that we have done in the past for math centers and reading centers and things of that nature, but it won't be required anymore. So let's take a look at who logged into Moe Max, for example, yesterday. I'm sure many of you are working on amazing things, but I can't necessarily see that. So um, shoot me an email if you want your name to be announced on the video, and I will add you to the list of people working during the week. Um, Aaliyah logged into Moby Max yesterday. Great job, Aaliyah. Brody logged into Moby Max yesterday. Awesome job, Brody. Talon logged into Moby Max yesterday. Good work, sir. And Tyson logged into Moby Max yesterday. Awesome job, Tyson. So, good job to those of you who are working not just on Moby Max, but everywhere on your distance learning. You are amazing. Um, let's get into lessons quickly for today. If you are a second grade writing center student, of course you have classwork and journals. You could make a list. You could write a letter to someone, including me. I would take an email about what you've been up to. Um, math centers, second grade math centers, you have classwork packets. You should have your last packet. When that's done, it's done. For me, of course, I would love to see you still hopping onto Moby Max because that adjusts levels for you so that you are working on things that maybe are topics that are a little bit harder, you know, brushing up on some skills. So that automatically levels for you. So hopping onto Moby Max when you're done with your grade level packets is a really great idea so that you keep your noodle engaged and learning the maths. All right. Um, third grade math centers, we are working in unit seven. I would like you to start focusing on unit seven, lesson three, so 7.3. Um, it is about number stories with different measures. Remember, that doesn't mean that you have to get out or look for big beakers like this or big rulers and things um, or get your scale out. The information that you need for those type of problems is right in the problem. So for example, for number four with the big beakers on page 225, it simply says how much more liquid is in beaker B than beaker A. So you look at the beakers in the picture. You don't need to fill a beaker, okay? And you look at the levels. Remember, when we are looking at thermometers or rulers or beakers and, a, and the level of something is part way in between, let's say, between 600 and 700, you have to think about the scale. Like what are they counting by on their number line basically. So on these beakers, it goes 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, right? So it's counting by hundreds. So you have to think, all right, if my scale is counting by uh, 100 hops every line, and my level, my water level, is halfway in between a 600 and a 700, what's half of 100? Okay, so half of 100 is 50. So when the line falls in between the hundreds, you've got 600, 50, put them together, that's worth 650 milliliters on a beaker. Okay, and the same is true on a thermometer. So when it shows a thermometer, you've got to look at that. Oh, is this counting by, you know, groups of 10? And then halfway is, you know, five. So if it's, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, let's say the line is halfway between 80 and 90, you have to do 80, five. So when you look at rulers, it's the same way. You know, they've got the little the little lines, well, on a ruler, those are parts of, you know, a unit. So that can be tricky because they're not always counting by ones and, and easy to figure out. So be careful on that. That's my quick tip from me to you. 
um, we're going to move on to reading. So second graders in reading, I have some more sight words for you to review with me today. So we're going to go through those rather quickly. Are you ready? Here we go. Boom. Oh. Ready? I just said it. I gave you an answer. Look at that. Don't give up. Be speedy, speedy. Third graders, I hope you know these. Chunk this one. And then blend it. Ooh, longer word. You got this. Break it into two little chunks of words you know. I like this one. One and done. Friends, that's a longer word. Almost done. Boom. Great job, second graders. We'll look at some more of those tomorrow. And the third graders, we were looking at the naming of Athens. It was a drama. We read all the way through it, and I was asking you some comprehension questions that are in the respond to reading section. So let's look at some more of those. Okay, text evidence. We looked at a couple of those. Ooh, this might be fun. So for those of you who have been listening in on the naming of Athens, um, it says write a new ending to the play in which Poseidon was the winner. Uh, what would be different? Hmm. So let's think back in this story. Poseidon had presented the citizens of the city with water. And he's like, oh yeah, it's fresh water. You're going to be all set. But Poseidon is the god of the sea. So for him to think that water is fresh water, he's surrounded by salt water. So what he presented to the citizens was not drinkable. And it actually, if you put salt water on your crops or your plants, it will kill them. So in Poseidon's mind, he thought his water was fantastic. Maybe you want to change something about that. Maybe he presented them with something completely different other than water. So that might be kind of fun. Why don't you have a discussion with a friend or family member retell the story to your dog, I don't, you know, I don't know, um, and create a new ending. That would be really fun. All right, so that is that for the respond to reading section of that story. I have another story here for you. It's called The Perfect Present. It's about comparing text and it says, read how Luke finds a perfect present for his mother. Oh, I wish I would have gotten to this right before Mother's Day. That would have been, that would have been great, huh? Um, it's realistic fiction. So let's talk about that genre a little bit. Realistic fiction. Okay, so realistic. I, the, the word real is right in there, right? Realistic fiction. Real. Oh, okay. But what is fiction? Let's break that apart. Realistic fiction. Is fiction real? No, it's not. Nonfiction is not fiction, so nonfiction is real. So that's super confusing because fiction is a fantasy. I kind of put that in my head because they both start with F. So fiction is a fantasy. It's it's not it's not real. So how can something possibly be realistic and fiction? Now, third graders in my reading centers group, we have run into this genre before and talked about it a lot. Dig into your noodle a little bit. Mm how can it be realistic and fiction? It doesn't make sense. Okay, so realistic fiction is a story that looks, feels real, 
could really happen. However, the events in the story or and the characters never existed. Okay, so they could describe a real event and then it becomes, you know, like historical fiction. You know, it feels real based on something that could really happen. Um, but the people were made up, for example. So in this story, we're going to read about something that feels like, oh yeah, you know, Luke seems like a person that could be real. But this is all fantasy. It's been created by an author. So that's how realistic fiction works. It's a great genre because you can connect with the characters. Sometimes it feels like you could even experience those things yourself. So let's find out a little bit about Luke today and then we'll wrap up the story tomorrow and maybe ask some questions on Friday. So it says, the perfect present. The day before mom's birthday, I went to the mall with my dad. I haven't got a clue what to buy for your mother, dad said. Okay, I haven't got a clue is underlined. It says, in other words, at the bottom of the page. Let's follow that down. In other words, I don't know. So I haven't got a clue means I don't know. I don't know what to buy for your mother, dad said. I sighed and said, oh, I don't know what to get either. I've got $5.50. I can't get too many things with my amount of money. Dad bought a shirt for mom. I looked in all the shops, but I couldn't find anything. I thought about making a card and buying mom a bar of soap. What do you think? Is that a pretty good present for a mom? If I was going to get soap for my mom and I was in the mall. I'm picturing the Valley View Mall in Onalaska, like the lacrosse one. I would go to Bath and Body Works because they have so many smells of soaps. And I would get one of those. And sometimes they're buy one, get one free. So if I bought one for my mom, I might be able to get one for myself for free. That would be sweet. Um, but let's pause there. A little bit of a cliffhanger. We're going to see if Luke does buy mom a card and some soap, if he's got enough for that or not. I know when I go to Bath and Body Works and I look at the bottom, actually, you know, I've got a Bath and Body Works lotion right here. Maybe that's why I'm thinking about it. On the bottom of this lotion, it says $12.50. So if Luke only had $5.50, I don't know if he could get mama a soap. We'll see what happens. All right, so we're at 12 minutes already. Oh my gosh. Okay, that is it for today. Thank you for joining me. It's sunny and nice for the time being. Enjoy it. I will see you tomorrow. Oh, bye-bye.